Um, so I'm going to be talking about prototyping technology, but focusing specifically on educational technology. So designing technology to support learning. And just briefly talk about my background. So I work at the London Knowledge Lab. And Patricia tomorrow morning is going to be talking a lot more about the kind of work we do more generally. But it's a very interdisciplinary place. Um, so it combines this, basically, my, it's a department within the Institute of Education and also Birkbeck College uh, in London. And just briefly to tell you, to give you an idea of my background. So I started off in psychology and artificial intelligence, and specifically in human cognition. So developing computational models of cognition, so for example, memory. And then I w uh, moved into the area of human-computer interaction. Uh, and then in the end, I combined the two. So I'm working in, I've worked in several research projects within the area of educational technology. So what is the end goal of prototyping educational technology? I think we can all agree that it's learning. Uh, so we might, you know, we need to specify what the learning is in terms of the knowledge and the skills that we want learners to acquire. Um, and we might, you know, have some disagreement about how we define that knowledge and skills. And also we might have some disagreement about how we evaluate whether learners have acquired those knowledge and skills. But I think we can, you know, agree that what we want to develop is a piece of technology that supports people learn. But what is the starting point? That is less clear. Uh, or perhaps, you know, there are multiple different starting points. So it could be, for example, pedagogy. Uh, so, like this event here, we might believe that people learn better if they make things rather than if they sit in a lecture and listen or if they read a textbook. Uh, and that, as a starting point, we might then think, well, what kind of tools can we use in order to support learners in, to learn in that active way? It might be innovative technology, so for example, I know iPads. So technology that's been developed in, in a different area, not specifically for education, but then we think, well, you know what? This might be a very efficient tool, a very applicable tool to learn in an educational setting. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of movement now with schools and teachers to use iPads and not necessarily know exactly how it's going to fit into learning. The technology is there and that drives the application in, in a sense of in developing educational technology. It might be new AI techniques. Uh, so, for example, techniques to uh, mine large, large, large um, amount of data. So then we might have a lot of uh, data about learners and we might want to look at that to see different patterns to understand uh, how, our, how our lectures, how our learning materials are affecting learners, identify weaknesses and see how we might be able to improve. Our starting point might also be what is suitable to a group of learners. So for example, we have, I don't know, primary school uh, children learning about geography in a field trip. That's our starting point. Then we might look and see, well, what kind of technology is appropriate for that field trip, for that specific subject matter. We can also think of these different starting points in terms of disciplines. Uh, so for example, psychology is a lot more theoretical. We might be looking at the learning process, trying to identify what kind of factors are influencing the learning process, and that affects the kind of technology we design because we want to be able to look into and identify the different factors. Uh, we might be coming from the point of view of education, which is more based in the real world. So we might be looking at the classroom context or the informal learning context and designing technology to take into account the kind of interactions between the learners and the teachers and the learners and their peers. We might be coming from the discipline of computer science, which is a lot more technology different. So what advances can we make within, you know, for, for, technology, for technology's sake? Similarly, with artificial intelligence, our driving, you know, we might, the driving force, the driving questions are about developing more adaptive technology, not so much perhaps the pedagogy. Or from a designer's point of view, we, the driving force is trying to understand what the learners need, what the learning context is, and therefore how the technology can fit into that. So what I'd like, what I'm hoping to do, is to hi highlight these different these multiple differences, these multiple disciplines rather, that shape the design of educational technology. Um, and look at the interplay between them, which isn't always necessarily smooth. You know, there are a lot of differences, there are a lot of maybe uh, contradictions in there, because each discipline has different questions, it has different goals, uh, and therefore there will be a bit of tension. I also want to look at the different processes and the methods that we have for involving learners in the design process. And also touch upon the question, well, you know, why would we want to do that? What do we hope to understand? How will that make our educational technology more effective? 
And also, again, the challenges that arise from trying to do that, from trying to involve learners in the prototyping process. I'm going to compare uh, two projects. So the first one, Echoes, uh, this was completed last year. And the aim of the project was to support the development of social communication skills in children with autism and also typically developing children. And the age range of the typically developing children was five to seven, so a lot younger than what a lot of education technology is aimed, aimed towards. Uh, with autism, obviously, age is, is quite relative to developmental stage. In terms of the technology, the ECHOES project was based around a large 42-inch LCD screen and with a multi-touch overlay. Uh, there were cameras attached to that screen, so we had computer vision to estimate you know, where the child's head was oriented towards, which part of the screen we're looking at, so we divided the screen into six regions. Uh, it was a virtual environment, so the child interacted with the virtual agent within a kind of virtual magic garden. Uh, and they worked on mostly joint attention skills, so jointly attending with the virtual agent on different objects and events within the environment. So the other project, taking on the teenagers, is very, very different. Uh, the aim of the project is to increase teenagers' awareness of energy use, so their personal energy consumption, and to encourage behavior change. Um, I don't know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking, good luck with that. Um, but there are different elements of the project. So there's raising awareness and there's behavior change. Uh, and a different, so whereas in ECHOES we were all working, all partners were working on this one system, uh, with the teenagers project, we're kind of a bit more fragmented and everything's going to be brought together in a kind of intervention. So our focus is on education. We're working towards the development of a collaborative mobile game. And I'd just like to emphasize that even though these projects are very different, they both try very hard to put the learner at the center of the design process. So really understand what is it that the learner needs and how can we design the technology to meet those needs. So the ECHOES project was led by Dr. Kashka Puraska pomster at the Institute of Education. I'm just going to show you a video because I think it does a much better job at explaining what the project is about and I will do in five minutes. So. I don't think I have audio. I think I've... Oh. The ECHOES project aims to develop a technology-enhanced learning environment in which both typically developing children and children with Asperger's syndrome at Key Stage 1 can explore and improve social interaction and collaboration skills. Some children can find it very difficult to explore different ways of communicating with, with their peers. Technology can actually provide a platform to try out things without the fear of failure or ridicule or exclusion. This is one of our first prototypes that we've created for a school up in uh, Scotland. The backdrop is a garden environment and the avatar gives uh, social cues as to which of the objects he wants the child to transfer into a vase. The data that we collect is very rich because we've got several webcams and it's got a multi-touch overlay on it. This is the black frame around it. And all this data is collected to see which social cues the child is able to pick up. There is a huge recognition of the importance of affective computing. And this is the ability of the system to be able to reason about and to act on what it observes about the child in real time. Context aware technologies means that we try to capture the context in which children interact with uh, uh, other peers and then try to build a system that intelligently responds to that context and the changes within. Not that one. We can correlate the kinds of sounds that the child is making with the facial expressions, where the child is looking, where the child is touching the screen. So for example, if the child is frustrated, it is probably a good time for the, for the, for the system to, to intervene. So hopefully, if we have uh, an agent who can display emotions as well as recognize emotions of the child, the children will be able to, um, to pick up on those, on those different uh, cues and transfer it to the real world. The project aims to create an interactive, multimodal environment that utilizes a number of technologies, 
But as co-investigator and a specialist in participatory design, Judith Good explains, at the core of their work lies understanding the needs of their users. If you're dealing with children on the autistic spectrum, then what you find is a lot of the technology that's been proposed for those children is often sort of seen as assistive devices. So what you're really doing is highlighting the difference as somehow those children are, are different from typically developing children. So when we started out designing Echoes, we started working with children in terms of the design. What do children like? What do they respond to? What are their preferences? And so we try and get them involved as design partners from the very start. The requirements we have in ECHOs are actually uh, slightly different from most of the other eye gaze um, systems out there. We've found out that when children jump around in front of a screen, it's very difficult to follow their gaze. And that's why we decided to kind of invest our time into something that would suit our requirements best. There are some schools already who, who have multi-touch screens, um, so this is encouraging. But it is still a very expensive technology. So it's probably not yet possible for every school to have. Whiteboards are now commonplace and weren't five years ago, and we hope that multi-touch surfaces such as uh, the one that we have in, in Echoes uh, are going to be much more widely available in schools in five years' time. So we try to look into the future here. The fact that the Echoes project involves input from eight institutions across the UK demonstrates the academic interest in how further development in artificial intelligence might impact on pedagogical attitudes of the future. When artificial intelligence kind of started out, there were, there were uh, big claims made about where we would be uh, in 20 years' time, and those haven't really materialised. So it is a very challenging thing. I mean, even just defining from a psychological theory point of view, what is motivation? What are the different emotional states? How should we be responding to them? And that's all kind of knowledge that teachers have, but making that knowledge explicit and then implementing it in the computer system is extremely challenging. There seems to be some early findings that indicate that just with the simple agent that we've implemented so far, that children who are on the spectrum are very willing to engage with Paul, our agent, in, in a sort of very meaningful way. There's some sense that they're able to regulate their behavior in a way that at the very beginning of the interaction with Paul that they weren't able to do. And that's really interesting. If you think back to your own learning, what were the points that really stood out? And I guarantee there was a teacher who behaved in an inspirational way. There were things to do that were really challenging and engaging and exciting. And there were people to talk to about you, what you were doing to help you reflect on what you do. And the extent to which computers are going to help us in learning and teaching is the extent that they can behave like that. Well done. If we can emulate human tutors and human teachers' behavior, then we can provide education that is effective for a much wider population than it is currently possible. It is not about replacing the classroom learning. It's about providing extra support to it, then I think it's, <laughs> it's something that, that, that is worth investing in. Okay, so... Okay, so you might have gathered from that video that actually the focus, the, the main driving force of the ECHOS project was the technology itself. So we've got this you know, amazing new techniques in computer science, computer vision, and artificial intelligence uh, that have been applied to adults. Um, and if the, we can transfer them and apply them in education, especially with children with autism, we can potentially you know, make huge advance, advances. Um, but it was, was very much driven you know, by innovative new cutting edge technology. Um, as I said, we, and we had to, explained it in the video, had the, the computer vision, uh, the work with adults, as I said, but when it came to the situation uh, within the classroom where the lighting is not you know, perfect, you haven't set it up, uh, the child is moving around, is uh, you know, maybe turning towards the, the teacher, turning towards the screen all the time, um, is a very challenging problem from the point of view of computer science. Um, there's also the issue of you know, modeling, so using that information to understand, well, what is the child understanding about the interaction? What is the child's effective state? So, for example, using facial recognition to see whether they're smiling or not. 
Um, and then, of course, there's a problem, well, how should the agent respond? And that's where the artificial intelligence technique came in. Um, you know, how do you program the agent to have these pre-programmed responses? And then how do you decide which, which response is appropriate at that given time? Um, in terms of the learning activities, so that was the starting point. Those were the givens. In terms of the learning activities, well, we had a virtual agent and we had a virtual environment. And within that, the child was attending to objects and events. And the skills that we were trying to support were the very basic skills of, of communication, which are you know, jointly attending to uh, the same object. Um, but again, that was largely dictated by the environment that we'd created. Uh, so as we see here, for example, the, the activities to spin the flower heads and then create bubbles from them, and then we can pop the bubbles. So the agent might be pointing, directing the child to perform a certain action within the environment. And we see whether the child is responding or not. In terms of personalizing the, the learning experience to the target group of learners, um, well, like I said, a lot of it was given by the technologies, the virtual agent and the environment. So it was the object and the events that we could tailor. And there was a lot of work done with children, uh, which is quite challenging, especially with young children, especially when those children are on the autism spectrum, um, to get to interact with them and to understand what, what their needs are uh, and what their likes and dislikes are. Um, and for that to be coming from the children rather than us directing. But we also worked a lot with uh, practitioners, teachers. Um, and that in itself had its own challenges because we as computer scientists or in having a background in artificial intelligence, we could understand how potentially the system could work. But trying to communicate that to teachers was, was difficult because A, they couldn't really understand what it was that we were talking about. We're talking about modeling the, the child's affective state or modeling the child's you know, cognitive understanding. But then also for them, they were saying, well, why go down that route at all? You know, um, it might have potential for you know, great advan advances, but you know, why don't we work with something that's a lot more reliable, that we're a lot sure that it's going to work? And, and so they find it really hard to work within the design space that we, we'd given them. So even though we're trying to involve other users and stakeholders in the design process, there were issues around the design space that, you know, the boundaries that we'd set. So moving on to the Taking on a Teenagers project, which, as I said, is focusing on uh, trying to raise awareness of personal energy consumption. And that's really the key problem for us there is that translating formal learning into informal uh, understanding. So, you know, they learn a lot about energy in the classroom and about the problems about climate change and how personal consumption, energy consumption leads to those. Um, but then you talk to them about their personal energy consumption and, they, and it's almost like they've forgotten that. It's all compartmentalized in their mind. Uh, they don't translate that into understanding of their everyday behavior and how their choices might give rise to those, uh, to those problems. So with ECHOES, the starting point was very much the technology. For the Teenagers Project, we started from, from the last point. We started from personalizing the learning experience. What is it? Uh, what technology is needed to support the learning needs of this specific group of learners? Uh, so we made that the first question. And it's really about understanding who our learners are. And there's a multitude, multitude of kind of dimensions uh, that we can look at. It's what knowledge these uh, learners have, what skills they have, what their motivations are, what their concerns are, what technology they actually use, what technology they're comfortable with, uh, what environment, what is their learning environment, their interests, uh, what sources of, of information are available to them, and also what sources they can actually access. So it's, it's a very complex space, and it, there's an infinite almost amount of detail that we could map out about each individual learner. Um, but there are structured approaches that we can use to help us uh, model a learner's context. And in our project, we're using uh, Rosemary Luckins, who's the PI of the project, uh, and her framework is the College of Resources Design Framework. And it basically categorizes, it's a guideline to thinking and defining a learner's context. It, it has three different categories of world resources, so the knowledge and skills that are out there, uh, the environment in which the learner um, exists, the tools and different people, so for example, the teacher or the online resources, and then, of course, we have at the center the learner and their resources, so their understandings, their conceptions, their motivations. But in between, so the learner doesn't have free access to all these resources in their world. There are certain filters, certain constraints. So, for example, their relationship with their teacher is constrained by, say, the timetable or the kind of relationship that they have. 
uh, the learners access to online resources, as we found, is constrained by the, their knowledge of where to find it, their, understand, their existing understanding, that, which affects whether they can actually understand the resources that are available to them, you know, their access to technology, etc. Um, so it's very important to identify what those filters are. And I'll just briefly mention a couple of methods that we used uh, to try to understand learners' context. One of them was photo diaries. Um, and it was very important for us here to not mention energy uh, when we asked them to create the photo diaries, because otherwise we just would have got lots of pictures of laptops and phones and nothing else. Um, we found that, you know, the concept of saying direct energy use, so the fact that, you know, a product requires energy to be created, wasn't something that they immediately understood. But interestingly enough, having those photos in front of us and engaging them in discussions, you know, they, they came out with all sorts of uh, concepts of, you know, the packaging, the food miles, you know, all that stuff was there in their mind. They just hadn't connected it with you know, their perception of their own personal energy use. We also use, use group work, because again, as I said, you know, they, it was very hard on an individual basis, on an interview or a questionnaire, they, they kind of leave things blank. They say, you know, well, I don't know how to save energy. I, you know, I'm, I'm really concerned about the problems to do with energy. And then we kind of say, well, how will it affect you? And they couldn't respond. Half of them didn't give an answer. They weren't quite sure. Um, so the information is kind of feeding it, you know, the information is there, but it, it hasn't quite um, been grasped by them. So that led us to the development of a prototype app uh, that for, with which they could capture their individual energy use. And then we got them to use that, and then they redesigned the app into something a bit more structured so they could send and receive challenges about energy, and they could also make pledges about their own energy consumption. Um, so in terms of learning activities, what were these based on? They were based on obviously the knowledge and skills that learners, we identified that were, you know, there were weaknesses in their understanding and also our definition of what knowledge they need to have in order to make informed decisions about their energy consumption. Um, the resources available to them, so it was interesting, like I said, you know, they, when we asked them what resources, where would you go and look for information, they listed all sorts of websites, but when it actually came to a task where they had to do that, they didn't really know how to use those resources. Um, what technology is available to them, uh, Again, we'd want to be, you know, we're not talking about the future, we're talking about now, so what technology do they have access to? So what technology can we use in a design of our intervention? And again, what motivates them? And it's very easy, I think, to be cynical about teenagers, that, you know, they don't really care about anything. But in fact, we found they do care. They care about, for example, the, you know, child labor conditions, you know, the clothes that they buy, where have these been manufactured? So I think, you know, there's stuff that do con does concern them and we can tap into when we start to raise awareness about their energy consumption. And lastly, we get to the technology part. And as I said, we're working with mobile technology because we, it can help us bridge that kind of formal informal gap and we can use mobile technology to help them capture their personal energy consumption. So kind of concluding, um, the problem with education technology is not that it has to be, it, it doesn't, it's not only usable and fun and motivating, but it also has to support um, learning. And it's extremely difficult to translate pedagogic principles into design. You know, we can talk about, you know, we need to help learners reflect or we need to help learners collaborate. And you might have a few guidelines about using prompts or whatever, but, you know, what does that actually mean in terms of the technology that we, we design? What, you know, how do we design it to support those different learning uh, processes? Um, and I think also we need methods to help us understand you know, who these learners are, um, what motivates them, how can we engage them in their learning experience. Um, I don't think it's good enough to just say, well, those, you know, certain issues like personal energy consumption are just too boring and I just don't want to know. I think, you know, we can't find, we can find ways as long as we understand where they're coming from. Um, and lastly, just to say that I mean, the technology, the design space is huge. You know, we have all these different new technologies, all these different ways in which we're going to, we can potentially use them to support learning, but the technology itself doesn't define a certain learning process or a certain learning experience. Uh, the technology exists, it doesn't exist within a vacuum, it exists within a context, say, whether the classroom context or the home context. And so we really need to think, when we're designing technology, what that context is, how it's going to be used. Um, in relation to, for example, peers or parents or teachers. Um, and just try and bridge all those dis disciplines together to you know, make them work with each other and hopefully end up with something that effectively supports learning. Thank you very much for listening.
That's really, really good. Um, I did learning games five years back and did that before we really had a lot of technology. So it's very much actually find out the learning process. And from learning games, that is traditionally introduction of material, then some kind of simulation where you work with the material, you make it your own, and then reflection all built in the same frame or, or the same space. And it was extremely inspiring to see how far you've gone in the field. Uh, it's really, really, yeah, very great. Um, I was really interested in the one where you said the, the personalization for the teenagers. Yes. Because they can really care about something, but it's not personal, so it doesn't affect their behavior. And for small children, identification and having a safe space to operate in. Very good. Questions? Yes. Sure, yeah. You were speaking about disciplines, but it sounded to me that actually I have to thank you. The first time I hear someone in English pronounce the, uh, the word pedagogy, I never heard that been, been done in English before. Thank you. That's possibly because I'm Greek. Aha, uh, uh, <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, that's something. Pe what would you say? Pe pedagogy. Pedagogy, thank you. Pedagogy. Sounds Greek, actually. Uh, but is that a discipline to you? No, no, uh, I think that was on my uh -huh. previous slide. That's interesting hmm. because uh, I went to, to the Stockholm University in 1992 and got myself one year of pedagogy, uh, which didn't uh, actually give me very much. Okay, so that was the first thing that, that I wanted to ask you because I think in Sweden, pedagogy is a discipline. Uh, and, and it's interesting uh, to... to it helps me to understand what you're saying because I agree with you. Pedagogy should be something, it's more like a lifestyle than a discipline. I think it's okay. more general than a discipline. Uh, the, my second question is about uh, you using the phrase AI, uh, artificial intelligence. Now, um, uh, actually, and, and still, it's just so that I can understand uh, what you said. Uh, it's not criticism, but uh, all the things you went through and similar things that, that people are doing doesn't actually involve uh, my definition of, of artificial intelligence. So I want to ask you, um, what's the artificial, artificial intelligence part of, 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 of what you presented? Is it in, in, the, in, the, in the user, in the kid, or, or in the system? No, it's in the system. Okay. So in the ECHOS project, is the system using information about where the, where the child is looking, or what the child is touching to understand what the child is understanding about the interaction and therefore to respond appropriately. And also within the behavior of the agent, so programming an architecture for the agent to respond autonomously. So you're not behind the screens telling the agent, you know, now look at the flower, now talk to the child. Um, so, so those elements would be the AI. Thank you, because th uh, then I understand. Then personally, I wouldn't call that artificial intelligence. I would call it an expert system, but now I understand what, what you are... We actually uh, do call out artificial intelligence in a lot of learning games because also, as you said, it, the system can then adjust if the child gets frustrated. Yes. So the term is used uh, in this way. But, you know, different disciplines and cross disciplinary we call things differently. That's what I want yeah, exactly, yeah. And I want to understand. Yeah. And there's also, again, whenever we talk in this cross-disciplinary, we mean different things mm -hmm. uh, with the words. Uh, very interesting talk, um, uh, t talking about uh, 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 you know combining different disciplines uh, for for the process of learning, and which is which is exactly what you know uh, uh, what what my whole professional life is about actually. So uh, I was wondering, uh, you were you were mentioning about uh, cognitive science and the different <laughs> forms of knowledge and so on. Uh, do you do you have any kind of uh, taxonomy of the different kinds of knowledge and and correspondingly different kinds of learning that that are required? Uh, because uh, for uh, I, I'll tell you why I'm asking the question. Uh, for example, we are interested in questions like uh, what we call episodic knowledge and uh, semantic knowledge. So so episodic knowledge is where we are we are involved in some episode. 
or some kind of an autobiographical situation, right? And uh, so it's like saying, oh, th this is what happened that day, and you know, and uh, recalling that, and th this is what I learned. While while we are, semantic knowledge is some general knowledge principles, saying you know it's very cold in Sweden or you know s such kinds of where where we don't re really recollect where we learned it, but but then we we j we just know that uh, uh, the you know somehow. Okay, somehow it's there in our general knowledge, and uh, so uh, we are interested in learning, uh, or we are, in, yeah, I mean, we are interested in in learning how we learn both kinds of knowledge, and uh, so I'm, I was wondering, w have you looked at uh, anything along those lines? And uh, but no, I mean, in these two projects, we haven't used any such taxonomy of knowledge. Um, it does sound vaguely familiar from my psychology days, though. Um, I think, I mean, we're all with the. I guess with, with the ECHOS project is about social communication skills, so it's not necessarily explicit understanding of how you relate to people. Uh, and then with the teenagers project, it's more about your behavior, so your understanding of the impact of your behavior. Has. So I guess it, it is translating factual knowledge in a sense, um, but no, we, we haven't thought along those kind of distinctions at all. There's been, uh, in learning games, there's been quite a lot of uh, looking into what can you learn with which type of context and situations. For example, live role plays and simulations are very good for understanding complex systems like political systems. Uh, but I don't think, Elizabeth, uh, do we have anything confirmative at that point? I've seen a lot of articles and also there's been a lot of elite schools developed the last 10 years where they've kind of been indexing this type of intelligence, this type of learning could be used with these methods or small workshops, but I haven't seen anything conclusive on it, just kind of working internal working papers for schools or teachers. One, one thing I see You're going to hear Patricia tomorrow uh, uh, on the London Knowledge Lab? I, I probably won't talk about this particular other thing. Here you go. Yeah. Um, this work by Diana Lorillard, Conversational Framework, which she, she started in, well, it was 1990, and she now has a book out called Teaching as a Design Science. And I worked with her for, um, on the Learning Designer Project where we look at the pedagogical model underlying the theoretical model. And she does look at different learning approaches and like, we include it into the uh, knowledge model to do that. Um, so yes, there is work and there's substantial work that has been done, but not that it's separate from the project. So Katerina wouldn't be, be aware of that. But it, it does answer some of your questions, like role playing what kind of learning comes out of role playing over if you look at uh, reading and writing a case study. And her book, uh, which I, I have here, and uh, I know I'm a great fan of her work, so it is an excellent start, but also the material on the website. So. And then I also think you will find, if you look into educational games, there will be a lot of papers published, not necessarily kind of books with the whole, because the educational game genre is looking into that as well to kind of to figure out what type of game for what. Yes, there's a question in the back. Can you send down the mic? Thank you. Oh, we got another one. Um, a couple, first, are there any studies that uh, demonstrate that kids actually get over this sort of hump and are able to communicate better with their peers through this type of technology? Uh, not through this type of technology, it's very new, but there is, I mean, interventions that do, do work with children with autism, the communication skills do improve. But then you also use this for typically developing children. Yes. So what makes you think that it will help typ uh, typically developing children communicate better with their peers? Well, I think it's a spectrum. I mean, that's a whole thing. And I think also there's, there's a point about technology not being aware of, of a child's, a young child's effective state. So often, you know, you kind of, well, it's anecdotal evidence, but, um, you know, you see young kids playing with computer games and it doesn't do what they expect it to do and they get extremely hooked and frustrated. Um, but technology isn't adaptive in any way at all. Um, so it's about the technology in this case is being adaptive and it's helping the child express their emotions or relate um, in a way that they wouldn't otherwise. Uh, so, so a big thing, for example, is inhibiting behavior. Um, so especially children with autism have great trouble inhibiting their behavior. Um, so it's all different sort of basic skills that form the, their ability to communicate with other people and form social relationships. Um, 
that that kind of technology would, would assist. But the reason why, why technology for children with autism is that they find it extremely attractive because it's a lot more predictable. So, the, I mean, there's always the question of how generalizable are these skills and might eventually be able to work with the agent, but does that mean they will then be able to work with their peers? And that's <coughs> an open question, you know, and it's extremely it's challenging to do that, even kind of with other intervention ways of intervening. Um, but that's a starting point, and the starting point is the technology, you know, your scaffolding. The technology is a lot more predictable, so they're a lot more comfortable with it. And actually, a lot of the feedback we got from the teachers is that, you know, I've never seen this kid behave so calmly. They're usually really aggressive. Um, whereas when they were playing with Echoes, they were a lot calmer and a lot more able to control their behavior. Uh, and, and I know that the emphasis, uh, both in your response and in the, the film, was on autism. But you, and you did say that they worked also with typically developing children, and which the, my question of the emphasis would be there. Because it seems that uh, however you boil it down, you're, it seems like you're developing individual to technology communication. And like you said, they feel more comfortable with it, et cetera, as opposed to actually developing peer-to-peer -peer communication, which obviously could be developed without technology at all. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and the, I mean, the man at the end of the film, it just sounded, he, he, he said, you know, it's like kids learn, you know, when they have engaging teachers, inspiring material, you know, supportive peers and so forth. Well... That's, that's the peak. That's where kids really learn. We know that. So why wouldn't we pursue that without the technology, yeah. which is necessarily going to be a step lower than that? Well, I think it's part of the scaffolding process. So you're, you're talking about why technology would typically developing children. Well, he, it sounded so, like he was, at that point, it sounded like he was just talking about kids in general. Yeah, I think he was, but... Well, shouldn't we be financing that then? <laughs> but, uh, shouldn't we be financing, you know, better teachers? You know, I mean, because that to me it seems like because one of the things it's it seems like part of the dilemma. It seems like you talked about developing climate change awareness by using technology, which uses energy. So you're using energy to tell kids they don't need to use energy, and then wonder why they don't see that this is connected to their personal life. Well, that's a different point, and I'll answer right? that. No, I'm just saying. No, I'll answer that. <laughs> Well, so that, according to that logic, then, Excuse me? Can I just we could add, end up with... I just want to add a point, because oh. uh, uh, from the learning game perspective, or how we'd work with interactive museums, we have very much the same discussion. Why don't we just have more people talking? We know the most effective learning process is between two people. But we very often use technology is, is to make differentiated levels of content, depending on the user's likes and preferences, to make us talk afterwards. It's a little bit different, in my opinion, from a, that perspective, with the situation of children has to learn something they got trouble with. And what we know from learning games, and generally from learning theories, and that was the second point the guy said about what makes you learn, that was a challenge. Something that challenges you, but we also know that if it's too hard, you get disengaged with the learning process. And that's also flow theory with how people work with learning and interact. So. For a lot of these children, the actual challenge will be to be with a peer because they will have trouble with it. So if they can get trained in feeling it's not so difficult, I was able to do it in a simulated milieu, then I can do it with my peers. I think that would be, for me as an interactive designer, a very good reasoning. I don't think it can take away the personal contact, but maybe it can make you train to be better at it. Um, so but that's from that perspective, I see it. But it just sounds like according to the logic that she was saying that that's not necessarily following that ideal path. If money is actually going to steer what direction it will take, 
then maybe we could look at, like for example, the healthcare industry to see where we might end up in schools, where already we're starting to use artificial intelligence and technology to take care of elderly people, or uh, Skyping in you know, conversations as opposed to people actually going and talking to them. So according to this path, maybe you know, we'll be sending all of our kids in 20 years to have their AI teacher at school, or a Skyped in professor. <coughs> Because we just can't afford real people. Uh, so I think it's Even though Cuba's been able to do it. I just have <laughs> to say, with that, that oh, sorry, then Gutenberg books would be the same. Then a book is the same. It's a way of actually making something kind of more functional instead of one person learning to the other. Then the book is a collection of knowledge. So I think the same argument could be used for books, basically. There's well, also pencils, another, yeah. there's another point for technologies that and something we, we got feedback on from teachers is that the teachers when they you know they're trained but they don't necessarily understand what the potential of the child is and a lot of the children like I said you know the teachers the teachers said you know we saw this child interact with the system and we never thought that they would behave this way um, so calmly um, and that they had reactions you know, in, in sharing, turning to the teacher to share what they were, you know, their emotion, the positive emotion of what they're experiencing on the screen that they had never done before. And it also helped the teachers understand what the potential of this child is by being placed in a situation where they're, you know, a lot more able to show what that potential was. Um, so I think there are a lot of reasons for it, but it's a valid point, you know, it's expensive technology uh, and you have to justify what, or if you're going to spend that, that amount of money and that, that cost. Um, you have to justify based on the benefits. I think that we know from uh, the very first kind of motion training machine that you can train up people's muscular structure with technology. There was a lot of motion cam uh, cameras training up and especially people after operation and long times at hospital. What we don't know yet is does this also transfer to this area? And that's why I think the project is really interesting. Uh, can, does it help? And you won't know before you run it for a long time. You won't know the effects of it. Yeah, no, But it's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I was moderating a panel discussion back in India uh, on uh, technology-enhanced learning and whether it really helps. And and uh, precisely the same question came up: uh, yeah. that you know whether uh, technology can really replace teachers. Should we not be working on teachers? And uh, so there was a very good point that was made by someone. Uh, I think uh, that that might be relevant here. The thing is that uh, good teachers are very hard to come by. Uh, even when we have a lot of people, uh, the number of good teachers are, are still very small. And given a child let's say it, it randomly picks a teacher, it's probably, uh, the, the probability of it finding a good teacher is very, very small. It, it would have probably found a bad teacher in the sense that the teacher would not have understood the child really and would be frustrated or, you know, uh, all kinds of, uh, 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 you know, all kinds of uh, uh, things which, which actually may end up uh, uh, being suboptimal uh, rather than even uh, better. So, uh, so what uh, technology provides is some kind of predictability in, in, in the behavior that uh, the thing is the, the child is guaranteed to have certain standards of, uh, uh, of learning which may not be ideal but, but, uh, but it, just, it, it does put some kind of a lower limit. Right? Uh, and the second point that, that also came up was that if, if teachers themselves were exposed to these technologies uh, perhaps the, you know these technologies can also help train teachers to to deal with children than you know uh, than children themselves. So so teachers can also learn from these uh, technologies on on how to uh, respond to to children. So so that well, might uh, be relevant. I, I, yeah, I, I mean I, would, yeah. I was just going to say I would say that the technology is a tool, <laughs> and like I said at the end, it doesn't dictate a certain way of learning or a certain learning process. It's how it's used and how it's designed and how it's used within the context. It's an extremely valid point. I would like to take it further because when I grew up and in my context, the problem was not, I, I didn't feel that the problem was getting good teachers. I felt that the problem was getting rid of the really bad oppressive teachers. <laughs> now, wait, no, I, I think this, this is actually interesting because I, I agree with, with Troy who, who asked, asked the questions very much. I do, but I also see and, and not artificial or intelligence or uh, agents or, or Macintoshes or whatever, even a pen and a paper uh, or a sandbox. Because w when, when you showed the, the, the first part, uh, what was the name? Echoes. Echoes. Uh, the thing was that the kid 
had a chance to do trial and error without the oppressive teacher's eyes, breath, whatever, you know. Uh, and and <laughs> that's fine. And if, 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 you, if you can give these kids uh, just half an hour a week where they can have this space, well, that's fine. That's good. Um, but we shouldn't, I think that maybe the problem is that some people think that, okay, this is going to, 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 to uh, uh, how, uh, who's Emma? Take over the role Take of the over. teacher. That, yeah. That's not the point, no. No, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon anyway. Um, but also I'd like to say that they're different, I mean, they're different kinds of research projects. And like I said, ECHOS was very much technology driven, driven. It was, you know, we have all these amazing techniques. Can we make it learn? Um, it's not always the case that, you know, we'll be successful. It's high risk, um, but it's something that you have to try because it potentially could have a big effect. Any final remarks? I, I really, every time there is learning involved in technology or formats, even back to role playing, we had the discussion with role playing was also, is it difficult to role play? Can it kind of change our mindsets? Uh, will we don't see the, the difference between reality and fiction? And these things are very interesting uh, gray areas when we start building more and more sophisticated tools. What I think is, I'm really looking forward when we start getting data and metrics on this, where we really kind of can see what happens. Uh, I think it's great projects, and I think it's wonderful you shared them with us. Let's give her a hand. Thank you. It's very, very interesting.